Welcome to the Artistic Finance Podcast, where we break down the wall between art and money. If you're here looking for how to be an artist and financially sustain a career, you're in the right place. Keep listening and join us as we learn about artists and how they make money work for them. Hello, everyone. This is your host, Ethan Steimel, here for episode 24. Thank you for tuning in. A special thank you to my patrons, who get the shows early and with bonus audio content, including the outtakes from today's interview. Today's guest is screenwriter and filmmaker Kevin T. Morales. Originally from Los Angeles, he has been artistic director of two theater companies in California and has worked post-production in Hollywood. Since 2008, he has been based in Brooklyn with his wife and two children. Kevin has worked at the New York Public Theater and last year shot his feature film Generation Rex. This summer, he shot another film during quarantine titled Shadow Vaults. Without further ado, let's get to our interview. Welcome, Kevin T. Morales, to the podcast. Thank you for having me. Um, and I'm just going to say for people listening in the future that we're recording this on October 5th, 2020. So we're amidst the COVID-19 pandemic and then also the Black Lives Matter protests reawakening. Yeah, there's a lot going on. <laughs> um, okay, so Kevin... Could you give us a recap of your life and your career? Uh, sure. Um, I'm from Southern California originally. Spent most of my growing up years in the San Francisco Bay Area. I went to this really amazing, bizarre boarding school outside San Francisco called the Athenian School. From there, I went to NYU for directing, although that sort of transitioned into producing and dramatic writing. Can I backtrack you? <laughs> the Athenian boarding school, what ages do people normally go to boarding school? Um, high school, but I was there from middle school through my senior year, but I wasn't boarding. My mom lived in the town that the school was in. So sometimes I'd stay on campus and sometimes I'd go home. I <laughs> kind of like was living the best of both worlds. It's like, I don't want to be at home. I'm going to stay here. I don't want to be here. I'm going to go home. Yeah. So it was a very sort of like loosey goosey boarding school experience, but I definitely experienced it. Yeah. Yeah. That's cool. Um, okay. So then NYU, back to NYU. Oh, yeah. So, uh, so I went to Tisch School of the Arts. When I was in high school, I had a sort of very stimulating conversation with Francis Ford Coppola about directing. And he was very adamant that I not go to film school as an undergrad. I should study drama or art history, literally like anything but that. He was very adamant that like you learn about other things because if you just go straight into film school, you become more of a technician than an artist. He was like, don't go to LA. He was like, go to New York, like live somewhere far away, live somewhere where it's hard. Like he just had this, you know, and at the time, like, not that I didn't have any reverence for him, but I was like, <laughs> like kind of an asshole, like 17 year old kid. And I was kind of like, yeah, yeah, eh, I don't know. Like, mm. <laughs> <laughs> okay, like whatever, you know, like I kind of like half took his advice. And I was like, okay, well, actually, I do like the idea of going to New York and being like 3000 miles away from my mother. And then at school, I realized that he had been absolutely correct. And I got far more involved in drama and theater and, and dramatic writing. I just saw kids like, like taking out credit cards and borrowing money from their parents to finance like student thesis films that were horrible. <laughs> I mean, they were nine times out of 10, they were horrible. And, you know, yeah. and everyone thought this was going to be their calling card and they were going to get an agent and the, the, the film was going to go to Sundance. I'm like, those things never really happened. And instead they were just burning money. And, you know, I was on this one shoot in Gowanus where these kids basically like figured out how to like crash a car for their film. And it was like all this effort and, it, and the film was so, gar it was so bad. <laughs> Yeah, and I got really mad at the program. Like, I was like, you guys are being irresponsible. Like, this isn't really how, like, you know, we should do this. Um, so, so I got into, because theater was sort of like, you're working with the actors, and it's not really about, like, any technical things, and it's about storytelling. And I felt like my learning curve was a lot sharper, like, directing a play that someone else had wrote, and I didn't have to write it, you know, but then figuring out, like, what am I interested in? What, what do I want to do? Because I feel like that's so much of your... 20s probably is just sort of like figuring out what you like and not in the way that like you're like oh I like Tarantino movies you know and so like I'm gonna try and make Tarantino film you know I mean <laughs> that there's like a, there's so many wannabes in that way right yeah. um and that really I don't think pans out for a lot of people and that's not how that wasn't my approach to it 
so doing theater was like a great way to kind of um, see what you were interested in because you could do a play in a couple weeks and put it up and have audiences and have feedback and you know and then and then move on to the next thing. Whereas like you know the film that I'm finishing post production on right now, Generation Rex, like this is like a three year commitment we've been in since you know sitting down and being like let's write, <laughs> you know, and then looking at American film market coming in November and being like, we have a finished movie. Like that was, you know, a massive amount of time. So G- Generation Rex, that's in post-production right now? Yeah, we are hopefully going to lock picture this week and then it's going to go to the colorist and the sound people and it'll just be for the moment a kind of like, this is the version we want people to see this is the version we stand by, whether we have to recut it or, or change things, that might be the case. But as far as being like, here's our product. Yeah. After I got out of school, I started a theater company back in San Francisco. And after kind of like doing theater for about two years, I was like, wait, I actually, I actually did want to make film, <laughs> you know, like <laughs> yeah. I, I had kind of made this long journey back to like point A. So then in 2003, I got a job at a post-production house in West Hollywood that made a lot of trailers and and commercial spots and stuff. I kind of shot like what I would say was my thesis film in 2003, put together with friends and 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 people on sort of was like I've I've written something and I'm gonna shoot it. Uh, I ended up getting a job offer to run a theater company again in the Bay Area. 2008, we were sort of like living in the Bay Area, doing like you know small professional theater. And it was kind of like, wait, this isn't really what we want to do. <laughs> like if we're, and if we don't, if we don't change course soon, you know, we had two children at that point who were seven and three. If we don't change the situation, like these kids are going to start feeling like, you know, we're taking them away from something that they've started, you know, putting roots down. And at the, and that, and that was also the first year of Mad Men wait, this is incredible. Like TV can like not just be about like doctors and like cops, you know, like we could have, like, this is almost like theater. It's like character driven. It's like thematically poignant. And I was like, I have, I have to go back to like the thing I really wanted to do in the beginning. I kind of told my wife, I was like, well, we either need to be in LA or New York. And she was like, New York. (laughs) So I was like, well, I'll make it work for more, for wherever I am. But she still, still really loves theater and she wanted to do theater. She was a stage manager. And so we were able to go to New York and she was able to kind of like get back into the Broadway community and and then I just started like writing and like trying to get better and like kind of making these plans for like how could I get into television like how could I get into film because I sort of like went off that track so 12 years later you're still in New York yes yeah I mean not presently but yes (laughs) um my wife works in wardrobe. Uh, I, I I love New York as a city. Every February rolls around, and I'm like, this is my last February in New York. But I, I really like it as a city, and it's and it's become a little feasible to sort of be there and not be in LA. And here's the business I'm in: making something that's commercially viable for the money that I can put together, and then selling it for more money. Like that's it. Like that's the that's the whole plan. Like that's the business. And if you can kind of keep doing that you've got a career and you're doing it, you know? So that's been for the last three years, like that's been the the basic plan. So Generation Rex is part of that plan. The film I shot this past summer in quarantine called Shadow Vaults is part of that plan. I mean, the film that I was supposed to shoot this year that's been postponed, like that's part of that plan. That's really the whole thing. It's sort of just like make the thing that LA wants, you know, that Hollywood wants and, and somehow kind of can't make on their own, bring it to them, be like, look, I made this, <laughs> give me money to make more of this, and hope that they do that. Yeah, yeah. The Shadow Vaults thing, so did you shoot that already? Yeah, so, and we, we started post-production on that about a month ago. Yeah, so that's fast moving. Yeah, that was really quick, and, and I didn't have other writers I was working on with, and, and, and was really just sitting in my friend's farm in Ohio in isolation, and was like really bitter that the movie I was gonna shoot in the spring had been it just fell apart part of my plan was to shoot a film this year so I'm gonna do that no matter I'm gonna do it anyway like despite (laughs) you know and not like in a dangerous like I don't care or I don't believe in the virus way how what's a what's a film I could make that no one has to interact with anyone else and we were all on zoom and I was like you could use sort of like this is like a format like this is a way you could tell a story not using actual zoom but sort of this like if everyone's in their own place and the producer of the film that we were going to make 
I kind of pitched him this idea. It's about a group of friends who are normally getting together every week to play Dungeons and Dragons. And they start telling each other ghost stories. And they just, they kind of escalate. It's very loosely based on a script I had written a couple years before, which was at a boarding school about a bunch of kids who sit around telling each other ghost stories during a blackout. It's not going to be everyone's cup of tea. If your favorite movie is Bloodsport, I don't know if you're going to love this movie because it's people, you know, in the sort of like video conference way, just talking to each other. It is about what scares us. It is about like hiding in your homes. It is about like invisible threats. Cinematically, I'm trying to recreate the idea of sitting around a campfire telling ghost stories, you know, and, and every one of these people telling a story has like their laptop and this little digital campfire in front of them. And it's very low stakes. <laughs> <laughs> it's very low key. Yeah. And, you know, maybe people will totally reject it. Um, or maybe it'll become this fascinating little like moment from this time, you know, that maybe people will look back on and be like, here's kind of an example of what was going on, like literally and thematically. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like there are so many, Films I watched when I was younger where I find them very boring or I don't connect to them. I don't relate to them. I don't understand them. And then you'll watch it with like the director's commentary and it adds all this layer of complexity that I had no idea. Yeah. I mean, things, things should really have context. So when I was running a theater company called Venus Rising, Venus Rising's sort of um, mission was to take old musicals, do them in sort of new ways with more experimental kind of staging, more, you know, like not worrying about like sort of like the panels flying in and doing the sort of very traditional, like, you know, how they did musicals in the 50s. And I would often come on stage before the show started and I would give everyone the context for the show. Without context, things don't seem meaningful or important. If you go to a museum, they try to give you the context about the artist, about why this was painted, and they, and they try to help you understand it. You know, not that it's irresponsible to not do that, but... It help, it's more enjoyable to understand where something came from. We did this one musical, On the Town, by Leonard Bernstein and Comden and Green, and it was written in 1944, and it's about three sailors who have 24 hours of shore leave in New York City. And if you're not aware of the context, the musical is quite fluffy and seems to really not be about anything. There's like not even really an antagonist in this film other than like time. If you realize it was written in 1944, them getting back on a boat has a larger meaning that didn't need to be told to anyone in 1944. Like, these boys could die. <laughs> this could be their last day on Earth. Each one of them is trying to do the thing, like, they're trying to do the thing that they feel like they gotta do. But none of that is ever said out loud. But in 1944, no one needed to hear it. I staged it with sort of like at the beginning of the film, there's like these air raid sirens and you can hear Eisenhower talking and you can sort of, you can kind of create this like pressure of like living during the war. And then like the music pops and these sailors come out and they're like, you know, but I would get up and I would tell everyone like, this was, this is incredibly powerful show because of what it doesn't say that everyone understood. But now, you know, it just feels like, oh, that show's not, not really about anything. It's like, no, it's about everything. They put on a Broadway musical during a war. Brooklyn still had to black out all their lights when a ship left the yard. Like there's not, like, it's not that this didn't hit home. One of the things that people really liked about our company was when we did a show, we would give you the context for like why it mattered. And sometimes it's obvious, but not always. Yeah, yeah. Talking about context, could you describe your demographics? I am 43, almost a dead center Gen Xer. Uh, on my father's side, we're Mexican. On my mother's side, we're like German English. I would say I identify as Latino, um, although I don't have an accent and I'm not a first generation and can assimilate quite quickly into the white culture, I suppose. I identify as male. Um, I'm straight. I'm a parent with two kids. Because I talk about money, I feel like the demographics are important. Absolutely. Theater, it's like it's mostly white. If you're not white or male, it's significant. Yeah, the theater audience demographic is incredibly frustrating. Having run two theater companies and knowing 80% of your audience is Caucasian women over 50 with a college education impacts what you pick to present. And if you pick the wrong things, no one buys tickets and your company folds. Yep, yep. <laughs> if you don't want to do Neil Simon plays, you have to figure out how to like 
get someone to watch something that they maybe don't think they want to watch but would appreciate. Right. Yeah. Okay, so to get to know your creative personality, what is a live event that you like to experience? Broadway. Most of the time it's it's frustrating and, and terrible, but the times that it's amazing is there's like no exhilaration like it. What is a piece of art that you like? I'm really a sucker for um, Caravaggio, European painting that's like so incredibly real. You know, Venus on on the waves and why why is it composed the way it is and what do things mean and you know. Okay, what keeps you motivated to keep working or inspires you to like make your next piece? Or I can't not be working on something. The pandemic was like the most prime example of me sitting there and being like, okay, but what could I do? Like, what could I do in spite of the fact that I can't leave this house? Like, how could I shoot something? And like, you know, cinematographers and costume designers and actors and kind of everyone to say, like, get on board with this sort of like process of we're going to put together gear. We're going to send it to someone. We're going to have like a shot list. We're going to have all these things. And I would say it's a problem. I think think it's a little bit of a problem. Fair. What kind of music do you listen to? My, my sort of go-tos is like obviously like stuff that's kind of like 90s or kind of 80s because it's just the stuff that I had and I remember. I listened to the oldie station when I was a kid because my dad had this like sort of weirdo thought that like everything after 1980 was communist. I, I'm very steeped in like Motown and the Beatles and the Beach Boys and stuff like that. And then, of course, there was the music I wanted to listen to. My parents got divorced, and then I was like, well, screw you. I'm going to listen to Prince because you didn't want me to. You know, and sort of just growing up with MTV. In the dorms, MTV was the only thing that was on the, like, TV in the commons. Like, no one changed the channel. Like, it was just MTV. So everything from, like, Nirvana to, like, Color Me Bad. I mean, it was just whatever MTV played. Not that I necessarily liked Color Me Bad, but... You know, going to concerts and stuff in your in your in your twenties and thirties and seeing, you know, like the strokes or cold play and like that kind of stuff. And then I've been trying really hard to listen to music that my children tell me to listen to. Right. <laughs> my daughter, she has very specific okay. tastes and and my son has is very very into like hip hop. Uh, you know, he's a kid who's growing up in Brooklyn, so and I liked '90s hip hop, but I didn't really like follow through on it that much. So it's interesting because they'll play me a song, you know, and I'll be like, "No, this is good. I like this." You know, like I like a lot of stuff by Lord because of my daughter, and some stuff that my son is playing me by like Travis Scott, and like you know, like so I can say like I do listen to it, but but also they'll play me something, and I'm like, "No, this is bad. Like this is bad." They're like, no, it's like, I'm like, no, believe me, you'll think this is bad about 10 years from now, you know, or 20 years from now. And then I found in the pandemic listening to a lot of like, I've been listening to a lot of Fleetwood Mac and Hall and & Oates, and I don't really know what it's about. <laughs> I mean, good, good stuff. It's amazing music. And my wife is just like, why are you listening to this? And I'm like, I don't know. Maneater. It's like great song. Hall & Oates Essentials from Apple Music, like bangers. All of them bangers. <laughs> That's amazing. Okay, so that was your creative personality. Now your financial personality. Are you bad or good with money? Bad. Bad. My entire artistic career has been sort of like constantly trying to partner with people who are good at it. A director is inherently a spending position. And I studied producing and I try to write knowing what my limitations might be but then it's very easy to sort of be like but we need this but we need this you try to find creative solutions to when you don't have the money for things always and and i don't mind having to work that way uh when i was running theater companies and stuff like i'm just sort of like we need this like we need this like let's make this work like let's make this happen and i and i think i'm exhausting to other people i was gonna say are you a saver or a spender but I guess as in working, you're a spender, definitely. <laughs> uh, and, I'm, and, I'm a, and I'm a spender in life. Um, I'm very bad at saving money. And I will have this sort of mentality of like, there's some money, then like, quick, buy this while we can. Growing up with like a single mom, she sort of had this attitude for a long time that like, we didn't have a lot of money. I was at this boarding school on a full scholarship. Her attitude was always to try to spend money on experiences. So she like wanted to take me on trips and we would like go places. But Christmas was usually pretty like, you get one or two things. Like, what do you really want? And I was like, I just want a Game Boy. I don't need anything else. Like just, just the Game Boy, <laughs> you know, like, so I still have that 
attitude a little bit. I also don't believe in credit cards, which has made life very difficult for me. Having horrible credit, but like they're scams. <laughs> <laughs> it's like 100% horrible do you have a credit card no wow my wife has one it has like a 500 hundred dollar limit wow it's kind of for those instances when someone's like you have to put down a credit card and you're like <laughs> okay i have a debit card yeah i'm not against the actual card <laughs> i'm against someone being like here's some money buy something and then we're gonna charge you for using our money that's it's horrible <laughs> it's really bad for you. You know, now you're making me self-reflect. <laughs> Philosophically, I guess I'm also against credit cards. <laughs> you know, I remember getting mail at the dorm being like, you're a college student. Why don't you get an American Express card? And I was like, okay. <laughs> you're living in New York and you're like, bam, bam, bam. And then you're like, oh, I can't pay for this. <laughs> you know, like, and, and sort of having no one sort of responsibly tell me what was going on and so like learning the hard way credit cards are bad and and you know my student loans were incredibly like predatory and I just I at some point I was like I just I reject this system and my credit score is horrible but largely I don't care yeah okay that's really cool that's really cool that you don't have a credit card (laughs) (laughs) um and also you brought up student loans which is another thing because you said predatory like I'm millennial age my age you can get loans but the interest rate is pretty low. I'm curious, your student loans, how much did you have and what was the interest rate on it? I got a scholarship at NYU for the tuition, but I had to borrow money for the dorms. I racked up $60,000 in student loans. For going to NYU is- That's it's, like nothing. That's like nothing. <laughs> it's like nothing except that when you're in the arts and you like can't afford like $125 a month to necessarily you know, pay it back. And also my wife went to NYU. Our loans are combined. So we have a lot of student loans. You know, it was just this idea explained to us by like our parents that like we had to go to college and we had to go to the best college and we had to borrow money to go to college. Any other debt you get in your life, you can sort of like repackage or negotiate or we work and student loans just do not You can't get out of them if you declare bankruptcy. You can't get out of, like, you cannot get out of them. And that's not just, you know, it's an entire industry that convinced our nation. Every American should go into $100,000, $200,000 of debt for a college degree. It's just unavoidable. And I don't accept it. (laughs) I agree. (laughs) I I don't accept it. It's had consequences, me sort of not accepting it, but like, I don't accept it. (laughs) When you say you don't accept it, you're not saying like you're refusing to pay or anything like that. No, but they like take the money out of my tax return. I see. Yeah. Okay. (laughs) Because I would sit there and I'd be like, okay, well, like, can we come up with a payment plan? And they were like, what can you afford? And I'd be like, well, it's 2008 and we're all totally unemployed. And they'd be like, okay, so you can defer for six months. Okay, so great. Let's talk in six months. Hey, still nothing going on. Interest is accumulating and like this interest became more than the principal. I mean, like this this horrible, in no way is there any empathy on the part of the student loan industry for people. At one point, I was just like, well, you just do what you got to do because every time I talk to you, I'll say like, I can, I can give you $75 a month. And they're like, that's too low. Oh, well, you, you can take it or not. I'm I, like this, you know, but they're like, well, but you'll die before you ever pay these loans back. And I'm like, can you hear yourself? <laughs> <laughs> like, like, listen to like what's coming out of your mouth. You've created a system in which you won't get your money back. And that's not my problem. Right. That sounds like a you problem. <laughs> You know, and they're like, well, you're, you know, we're going to affect your credit score. And I was like, go for it. Do it. Tricks on you. I don't have a credit card. (laughs) Yeah. yeah, Like, you get like tricks on you. I don't care about my credit score. Like, that's the only leverage you have on me. Like, and people are like, well, how are you going to buy a house? Never. Never. Maybe never. Yeah. (laughs) You know, like, at the rate the world is going, I don't know what good it would do me. I did have a house for a brief time. And guess what happened? The real estate market collapsed, you know, and the the value of that house was half of what it was worth. Guess what happened? Like, we don't have that house anymore. You know what I mean? So I, like, don't really buy into this system where they just leech money off of us. For who? For what? For stockholders? For, like, hedge fund managers? Like, so that they can live in this 
bizarro world that social media now lets us see. Like in the 80s or 90s, there were rich people, but you didn't really have any insight into their lives. And we were all convinced that rich people do stuff and like help us. But now we see rich people and we're like, you don't do anything. You've just created a system by which you just collect money from people who don't really have it. And I refuse to cooperate. <laughs> and they're given more value in our society. Than- yeah, because because they'll throw a few thousand dollars at someone running for Congress. I mean, like, it's just it's just such a racket. Because a landlord who just owns a building charging rent, are they more valuable or a trash collector? I don't know. I would sort of argue that the trash collecting is more important. <laughs> exactly. You know, and like in New York City, this was like a big thing during the I mean, still a big thing. This sort of like, there should be rent forgiveness. And every politician is kind of looking at each other being like, yeah, but see, we are landlords. So that's not going to be the solution here. You know, like the solution will be to give you money to pay us. That's going to be the solution. I've paid my rent through this pandemic. Part of me kind of wants to be like, I don't want to, you know, and then someone's been like, well, you don't have to because they can't throw you in jail. Like, for, yeah, now. Like, for now, they can. For now. And like, and what is what is the consequences of this, you know, down the road? And maybe I shouldn't care because I don't care about my credit. Yeah, it's just it's it's unsustainable. And and then people are going to be surprised when there's guillotines on the lawn. If any if anyone's watched, you know, some read a history book, like guess how this goes. It was 2015. And I listened to a podcast called the investors podcast they're sitting there analyzing the wealth gap in the united states and globally and they're just like it is so unequal and historically when it gets so unequal there's revolution (laughs) and they say we're sort of there and uh you know i don't know what to tell you like they're sort of conservative leaning talkers but they're like something has to happen to close this wealth gap and that was five years ago (laughs) right and you know and this and the you know and the idea is like oh well you can have a revolution in america every four years we can have revolutions that don't like end in like violence i guess people listening to this podcast in the future will like know (laughs) (laughs) yes this is the (laughs) pre-revolution podcast yeah we're like 30 days for from an election and i don't know if it's going to be a peaceful (laughs) transfer of power to be in that place is really shocking to a lot of americans and for a lot of Europeans or anyone else in the world, they're a little like, welcome to our world. <laughs> yeah, you're welcome to our world. And also you're doing it to yourself. Yeah, like, like this is all <laughs> self-inflicted because you just love your racism so much. Yeah, wait, seriously. Okay, wait, one more note on this interest student loan thing. Somewhere in the Bible or the Jewish text, there's a rule. There's one of their old school rules that says when you lend somebody money, if they're of your tribe, you don't charge them interest. But if they're a stranger, go ahead and charge them interest. If I had to cherry pick like one good thing out of a religion, that would be it. We should work together to help others borrow money. (laughs) Yeah, it's just amazing that we have a a system of government that wants to rob us and doesn't want us to have better lives. That's the pre-21st century thing that's got to get killed. At the start of your career, so I guess when you got out of NYU, um, what did your finances look like at that point? Horrible. They were horrible. My wife and I got married a few months after school. We started a theater company but had jobs. My wife was working at a magazine. I got a job in the ticket office at the theater that invited me to start a theater company in their sort of black box theater. And we were renting a little apartment and trying and and funneling a lot of our resources into a theater company that was financially not set up to succeed just my fault entirely critical reviews san francisco chronicle named on the town like the best musical of 2000 like the work we were doing was great and and widely appreciated but i was constantly trying to hire union actors pay people i didn't want to be doing community theater that was just an incredible stress and i just i should have taken it more slowly and so that was all just sort of unsustainable. And then, and then 9-11 sort of put the nail in the coffin. That makes me like you so much more. That you, The fact that you like <laughs> wanted to pay people for their work, that's a big thing for me too. Yeah. <laughs> there was like this award ceremony that they would do every year. And, and they were like, oh, you, you can't qualify for these awards because like you're paying actors. And I was like, good. Yeah, yeah. I don't want to qualify. <laughs> like, yeah. like, I'm, I'm like I'm like happy with this. And then... It's kind of funny because like you fast forward a few years and then they all started doing it. Have you had any health challenges? Um, I have diabetes. Have you had that always? Uh, No, it was sort of dormant 
right around the time I turned 30, I had lost like a lot of weight and I was like acting crazy. And I attributed it, a lot of it to just the stress of running a theater company. But like, I wasn't necessarily like exercising or like changing my diet or anything. And I just felt like I had like headaches, like every day around four o'clock. And I was really like a nightmare. Like I, like people did not like me like come to find out it's like oh your body's not processing sugar and you stop producing this like hormone so (laughs) it took a little while to kind of figure everything out but eventually i went on insulin and everything it kind of like all evened out did you have health insurance at that time yes but not through my theater company it was basically through my wife having insurance through actors equity when i got hired to run that theater company i hired her as the production manager and she was stage managing almost half the productions and that was one of the things when i went to the board was like this has to happen and i directed i think we did five or six shows a season i would direct like four out of the six and i would give myself a directing contract so i think between the health insurance from stc and from actors equity we were covered but like people would be like well why are you paying yourself like five thousand dollars to direct this musical couldn't that money be put somewhere else it'd be like it could be but then i don't have health insurance (laughs) you know like you say five thousand like oh that's so much money shall we break that down hourly that's gonna boil down to like three dollars an hour yeah (laughs) yes and you know like essentially my wife was basically making like minimum wage you know stage managing a bay area theater like equity contract and stuff stage managers put so much time into a show and same for directors we're talking like 16 hour days and and my kids like grew up at this theater they were there because we were there and it was great i mean it was really great you know that we had like this sort of like family theater and i got to like create like the culture that i really wanted but the board of directors at the time was really torn about it because i was really asking them to do a lot more and they like kind of would come back to me being like is it worth it and i'd be like I can't help you, (laughs) you know, like, uh, I can't help you, but you clearly are annoyed that I'm asking you to do more when you have a business and this isn't even like your job. Like you just come in once a month and have a meeting and, and just sort of question my decisions. And it's not like, I'm not okay with being questioned, but don't, don't get mad that I like want to make it so that we do this for a living. And that, and that's like the other thing that's like kind of uniquely American that I hate is this idea that like we punish artists. Oh, you want to do what you like for a living? Well, then you can't have any money because I'm doing something I don't like, so screw you. You know, I mean, just like, why is it if you want to be an actor, you want to be a writer, you want to be a playwright or a director, you have to suffer, like you have to starve. It doesn't make people better artists. We had somebody named Ariel Estrada on here. Somebody told him and said, you choose to be poor. That's a, that's a way of saying like in America, like if you want to be an artist, okay, be poor. Exactly. Like they, they, they intentionally want you to suffer because they don't want to be an accountant or whatever they're doing. And every, you know, this is going to sound super socialist, which I don't have a problem sounding. Like everyone should be able to make a living doing something. Arts is like the most important important industry and obviously that's easy for me to say but like i have no problem with you sounding socialist either <laughs> <laughs> I, th- I think there should be a federal job guarantee you know i think the minimum wage should be 25 bucks or something like that yeah it, it just should if minimum wage was like livable then you know people could be artists you know like people could do both people could work at starbucks and then go home and work on their novel or or painting this idea that art has to be like a side hustle it's just so unfortunately american it's really funny like because some people have been like well how did you pay for this movie that you shot in quarantine because i couldn't take you know people who were investing in the other film and move it and when the small business association was basically giving out loans i applied for one and they gave me a five thousand dollar loan and i was like i'm gonna make a movie awesome (laughs) you know like that's my budget you know like i hope no one who is maybe gonna eventually buy this movie hears this on the podcast because i don't want them to lowball me I want them to think I spent $100,000 on this movie or whatever. And literally everyone who's working on the movie is just getting points. There wasn't enough money to really pay anyone, which I believe in paying people. So if someone passed because they couldn't accept that, I there was no hard feelings, you know. The DP, the editor, all the actors, like they all have points in this movie, you know. So my movie is actually exceptionally communist. <laughs> You know, like we all own part of this movie and and hopefully I can convince Hulu or someone to, you know, buy it off us. Artists, we have the stereotype that they're bad with money. Not having money and being bad with money are sort of like two different things. Absolutely. (laughs) 
Absolutely. <laughs> because you have all this money stuff figured out, and, and you say you're bad with money. No, you're not. You you have figured out how to make it work through all these weird, crazy ways, you know, your entire career. <laughs> I, guess I, I guess I feel like if I was good with money, then I'd have it. Uh, no. If you have excess money or when you have excess money, where do you put it? For the last six years, seven years, my wife was like, she was working so hard on Broadway shows, which take no holidays. And we were, you know, in our small Brooklyn apartment and doing all the things, you know, get by. And at one point, Lauren Bacall offered my wife passes to Disney World because she gets lifetime passes to Disney World because they have pictures of Humphrey Bogart up in places. So it was like, okay, free tickets to Disney World. Like, let's figure this out. And we, we saved and we sort of made it the Christmas presents, you know, like, I mean, we, you know, and it was everyone's birthday present. And we went to Disney World and we had a great time. Yes, we could have taken that money and like put it in an account and like done that every year and have like some more money, but we'll never get this time back with our kids. We will never have that again. We, we really kind of figured out how to go to Disney World almost every year. We even were there in January before this kind of broken out, even though I was sort of like, should we be getting on planes? And like, I bought us masks. Diseases spread, <laughs> you know, like this is, it's not going to just like live in China for its whole life, but we still went and we had a great time and, and, and we have pictures and memories and, and it's like, and you know, my kids are now 19 and 15, you know, and I'm glad I didn't put aside like four years of that money and just to have like another 20,000 in the bank, which yeah, like having $20,000 is great. I would rather have had that time with my kids and those, and those the pictures we have and the memories we have and the stories that we tell to each other all the time. Like, remember when, <laughs> you know, like we have little videos, you know, all that stuff is so that's what matters. Yeah. That's all. I mean, I love talking to you. It's all like warm and fuzzy. <laughs> 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 Even when you talk about like overarching, depressing things, it's like somehow warm and fuzzy. I'm like, yeah, hope for the future. <laughs> yeah. Hope for the future. I, yeah. I'm, uh, yeah. I don't know if I have hope for the future, but I'm going to, well, we do, we do, we do. Uh... Sure. Sure. <laughs> Um, do you think about or worry about money on a daily basis? Yeah, pretty much. So one of the reasons we're not in New York presently was because our rent was becoming unsustainable. Because my wife isn't working and I wasn't able to shoot the film that I was supposed to shoot. And so there's just been, you could, you could sort of see on a timeline when this runs out. So we subletted part of our apartment. Our rent is now substantially less. We don't want to lose the apartment because we've lived there a long time and the, and the rent we're paying is hard to find anymore. Can I ask what it is? Just because I love to ask that question. <laughs> oh, sure. We have a three bedroom apartment in Brooklyn with laundry and a dishwasher and we're on the top floor and we have a balcony and we're paying twenty five fifty For Brooklyn, that's not a lot. Sounds like paradise. It's not a great <laughs> apartment. Like the kitchen is very small. There's a lot, like the ceilings leak all the freaking time. We have our landlord like on the phone a lot, but... We didn't really want to have to figure out like, okay, well, we're going to put all our stuff in storage. And then at some point we're going to have to try and find a new apartment. You know, it was just like, can we just figure out how to sort of like make this last? And my wife's collecting unemployment. I'm getting the sort of minor pandemic unemployment that New York offers where it's like, you didn't really have a job. <laughs> like, but we also recognize that you can't really get a job, you know. So between the unemployments, there's some money coming in. And then we were sort of like, great, well, we're going to leave our apartment and have some help paying for it. And we're just going to try and spend as little money as possible. Visiting family, we're sort of nomadically driving around the country. And we got a car to do this. We didn't have a car. We haven't had a car since 2010 because I was trying to help the environment for which I've now learned my contribution has made no difference. So we bought a used Volvo and like, <laughs> you know, have been just sort of tooling around uh, avoiding people. Throughout your life, have you used a budget? Not as much as I should. But again, it's sort of like a head in the sand. Like, it's depressing to kind of see, oh, we shouldn't really do that now or shouldn't really do this now. The budget has been sort of mostly in one's head where it's sort of like, okay, well, here's here's my wife's paycheck and here's what's come in from doing a writing gig here or something here and, and then being like, here's our bills and like, we can do this or we can't do this. It's just It's just always inconsistent. Even my wife doing a Broadway show versus another broadway show the salary she gets can change quite dramatically even though it's sort of the same job but every show is different what is a fantastic financial decision that you've made a 
couple years ago, a friend of mine from school got me interested in Bitcoin. I got into that a little bit and then it like kind of exploded and it was like, oh, that, that worked out. For the most part, that's pretty much all gone at this point. <laughs> <laughs> that's still cool. That's still cool to, uh, that you did it. Well, uh, I think right now I'm sitting in cash because on my little charts, it was sort of like, I think this is going to go down. So let me just trade out of it. And then it was like, <laughs> so I haven't really bought back in. So it's just sitting in a bit stamp account. What's been a bad financial decision that you've made? Almost always putting money into a show because that's the only way it's going to keep going every time every time so you try not to do it too many times because you really once you once you've been burned that money's not coming back and i just helped float something and it you know i guess i guess you could say again well well maybe there's some like benefits out of it for everything to keep going like the show needs you know this amount of money and you're like oh, okay well technically i have that you know and then right right when you get paychecks, are you just getting them to Kevin Morales or do you have like an LLC or an entity or anything like that? It totally depends on what I was doing and for who. I personally don't have like an S Corp or something. If I write something and I'm paid for it, then I just get a fee. If things that I've made like a film sense, like the films have like LLCs. I guess Generation Rex, do you get like paid through the LLC or are you just like taking a cut of the movie if it ever sells? I would be paid through the LLC. I have a directing agreement with the LLC. The LLC has a co-producer. So me and another person are the producers who own the LLC. But because I'm directing, we had to sort of make a like, but as director, this is your, this is what you're entitled to. Um, so then is most of your income 1099 income? Yeah. I haven't had a W-2 since like, I got a part-time job at Crate and Barrel sort of early on when we moved to New York. That's like the last time I've had like a W-2 where they're like, you're an employee. Like, you know, we're taking out the payroll taxes and like that kind of stuff. Speaking of filing taxes, do you file your own? Yeah, because they're not that complicated for me. With kids too? I've never had kids. Uh, yeah, I mean, they're just like a deduction. They, I get my two dependents. The standard deduction is almost always better than me sort of like itemizing like every little thing. I always do every year, like just in case. And then it's almost always just like, you have two kids, <laughs> you know, like, and we don't make that much money. We've just never really had too many things going on where we really needed like tax people to get involved. Like we don't own property. We don't have dividends from anything. You know what I mean? It's pretty cut and dry. Like this is the money we made. That's how much you took out. We have two kids. Give us some of it back. <laughs> <laughs> like that's pretty much how it comes down every year. Do you have a retirement plan? And if so, what does it look like? Me specifically, no, but my wife does. Through through the union? Yeah. Okay. All right. I'm not saying you're old, but... <laughs> <laughs> well, like, now they have the 529 savings plan for college, mm -hmm. but I actually don't know if that was around when your kids were born. I was going to ask if you did anything like that. No. The only thing that's sort of kind of, like, unique in our situation is is both my kids got into acting because they were growing up on sets and backstage at theaters and they liked doing it. And I definitely didn't force them to do it. Like they had to want to do it themselves. So, and they've both done pretty well. No one's Dakota fanning or anything, but like they book like a TV show guest spot here, like whatever. And like my son plays Iverson on Succession and my daughter's been on like Law and Order and stuff. So they've been able to put some money away from doing their own work. So yeah, so they've got these little trust funds that you have to put money into it. The Coogan laws that the studios, whoever like takes money out of their check and puts it into that account, they have a little bit of something, but we've almost just living in New York and being it so expensive, me trying to sort of like make this career work where I'm not like doing a nine to five job. We have not really had like excess money to save. And my wife has been a, you know, a total godsend by sort of really being able to kind of support us. The New York theater industry, there's enough work that you know we really could have me doing sort of like little things here and there i directed entertainment for the nfl when the super bowl was in new york <laughs> there was a fee there like yay you know like you know so between like you know me kind of like peppering things around and then her working pretty consistently because she's so good at what she does 
we've just been always sort of able to get by, but we've never been stashing it away or like making excess. Like New York is just so, so, so expensive. <laughs> what job have you had that has been the most financially lucrative? I directed a series of films for the New York University School of Social Work. They just paid me gobs of money to do it. I don't know why, except that the woman who was in charge of the program, it wasn't her money. And the university is just the third largest landowner in New York City, and they have more money than they know what to do with. And they would just be like, is this okay? And you'd be like, yes, <laughs> that's great. You know, like I'll happily do this. I'm sure they have it based in some whatever system that they have for like bringing in professionals to do things or like whatever, you know, I don't think it was like an arbitrary amount of money necessarily, but it was like way better than someone paying you to direct their short film or something. So probably in recent memory, that's the sort of the job that was like, wow, this is, this is awesome. And the NFL thing paid pretty well too. Although I feel like it should have paid me more, but because they have the money also. If we take money out of the equation, what job have you done that you're most proud of? I, I probably would have to use like Generation Rex. I have not been paid for it, but getting to work on the screenplay with my daughter, getting to like go through this process of from idea to market, like through kind of all five stages of like a film's life, like scripting, writing, development, financing it, production post-production and now we're sort of gonna quickly be entering the like marketing distribution phase and for her to see like all the steps that it took for someone to say like oh you should just make a movie like it's like too overwhelming it's like too audacious a thing to say but when you start to break it down into just all the steps it's like 10,000 tasks to make a movie putting a person on mars getting someone elected there's like 10,000 tasks and like obviously there's like some luck involved there's things that you have to roll with but like at the end of the day you have to just sort of like go through your checklist and be like did we do this yet nope okay we got to do that now that's done you know and you just if you kind of just keep going one one line item at a time like you can sort of get yourself there she's been in movies i mean she's been directed by spielberg she's been you know directed by steven soderbergh like she's been on set on something that has like a lot of money and she's done her her specific job but now for her to see like my dad came to me with an idea we fleshed it out we brought in someone else like we wrote it we raised money for it we shot it I mean she can just see everything that had to happen including like feeding people for three weeks you know like how do we get people places how do we you know I mean just every little thing and I don't know maybe she'll never want to do it again <laughs> But I think she will because she's smart and she likes acting, but I think she's capable. She's, she likes writing too. And I think she's capable of being a filmmaker and for her to have agency. You know, she does identify as female and it's so hard for women directors. One of the stats I saw was like, they have to have 10 years more experience than a man of the same. So it's kind of like, well, if I can get her started at 17, then when she's 27, she should be in the same place that was some guy who went to film school and is like out and he's like raising money. You know, like it's sad that she has to do so much more to be considered in the same place. But then if that's the system, then that's what we have to like work towards. And we can try and change the system, of course. You have to be proactive. You can't just kind of sit on the sidelines and be like, it sucks that it's like this. Like, it should be different. <laughs> like, yes, <laughs> we all agree. But if you want to do the thing, do the thing. Yeah. How much of your success has been hard work versus luck? It's like 80% hard work. And doing the hard work, like, sets you up for more luck because people see that you're working hard. Getting the San Francisco Chronicle to come see our production of On the Town was like luck. He could have just been like, nah, I don't want to review that show. You know, the head theater critic. I don't know if it was just because he hadn't seen the show in a while or maybe ever, you know, like whatever, for whatever reason, he rolled out, you know, to the East Bay and saw our production of On the Town in a black box and then just wrote the most glowing review. The Chronicle has like the man sitting in the chair and then the man clapping and then the man jumping up and down and clapping like it has their little like icons. And it was like the little man jumping up and down and clapping and he just was like, and after that review, it was like, oh, people want to interview you on this radio program. Like people like, you know, suddenly it just, it just drew attention and then you try and capitalize on the attention. If money wasn't an issue, what would your life's goal be? I would be? really love to get into television because I feel like it's a little more like theater, like having sort of your company and like your, it's a little more, it can be a little more character driven and, and I think you can explore longer stories and, and, and exciting themes. 
that being said, I think a film is has its own place. You know, I, it's sort of hard to compare them, except that they're both on camera. I keep joking, but I'm like, I'm going to move to Norway <laughs> and start a production company. And my goal is to just to keep making films for X amount of money and then, you know, selling it for more than I made it for, you know, until people are really giving me the money to do it and not really questioning my track record or, you know, the commercialness of it or, you know, I mean, to have that sort of, you know, almost like a Wes Anderson where it's sort of like, I don't know if anyone even cares what he's written at this point. Like the money is there. You know what I mean? Like it's just the, the team is there. The people, the actors are there. Like the people are just there, you know? So that's my goal is to sort of try and get to a place where people want to see what I'm making and they trust me and what I'm making. What financial advice would you give yourself back when you started? Or would you give a film director who's starting out right now? Don't be afraid to have like a job. I very, I think, arrogantly and pridefully was like, this takes all my attention because I wanted to give it all my attention. But probably I could have saved myself a little bit of stress by just having like, you know, a a foundation where I wasn't constantly sort of being like, are we going to make rent this month? And I think not being, I think I would have also told myself to like not be afraid to do certain things because it felt like they were too big or too, you know, whatever. But is now a good time for students to study art? Like, should they be studying, directing and acting, et cetera? Yes, I think so. These are industries that aren't going to die. They're going to change. I mean, it's probably going to be a very, very long time before there's like real theater again. There's no rush. New York's not going anywhere. LA is not going anywhere. Like making movies isn't going anywhere. You're not an athlete where it's like, you know, you have a shelf life and it, by the time you hit 34, you can't be a running back anymore. You know what I mean? Like there's, and if you're really talking about being a playwright or talking about being an actor, this is a really big picture career where you'll have ups and downs. And, and honestly, people didn't really, sometimes people just don't take you seriously until you reach a certain age. Everyone who's older than you knows how little experience you have. Um, and obviously that's like a really gross generalization because some people can be young and have had incredible experiences that they can draw on. The goal is to educate yourself, find what you're good at, find your voice. And you do that just by living and experiencing life and not necessarily tucking yourself into a, an apartment and just writing nonstop, you know, because it's kind of like, well, what are you writing about? Eventually you're going to start writing about what it's like to be a writer. Right. You sort of mentioned it, but are you in unions or which unions are you in? So I suspended my SDC membership because I just really wasn't doing theater anymore. I haven't directed anything since I directed this like big production of Evita in like 2009. Was kind of doing like little like off off Broadway things, but sort of like things that weren't financed. Uh, and I sort of was like, I'm not, I'm not really pursuing this right now, so I don't really want to be paying these dues. So yeah, so presently I'm not in a union. I didn't know if there was any like film directing union or there i mean there's the director's guild but i haven't been doing enough work to justify joining that guild yet if generation rex comes out and gets distribution and shadow vaults does and then if the next project i'm doing reaches like a certain budget level i can probably justify it you know but until you can justify it there's like not a reason to rush into it yeah uh, what can we do to stress the importance of finance and savings to fellow artists? I mean, I, I always wish that like, but I, again, I don't know whose responsibility it is. I feel like a lot of people come out of arts programs or studying and they don't understand their taxes, they don't understand credit cards. They don't, I, th- I think there's a pretty low financial literacy that falls on parents. And maybe there's a good high school out there that has like a, what would have been like a home ec class that kind of like gives you like, this is how these things work. You know, this is how a bank account works. Uh, So yeah, I don't know. I think there's either artists who have financial troubles and so they learn the hard way or there's artists that don't (laughs) and it doesn't, it doesn't matter to them. You know, they're being supported somehow, which I'm not criticizing. It's just, it's, that's the difference. Yeah. I think that's also like in uh, a college program, there might be a business class or a business of entertainment class it's also hard because everybody's personal experiences sort of factor in you know if there's somebody struggling and there's somebody not struggling like that's just a very different experience one of the best classes i took at nyu was called contracts and law and it was all about entertainment law and it was like here's this agreement and we would walk through and sort of like look at like these kind of like standard traditional often used clauses 
and discuss what they meant. That was like the most important class. I mean, you know, and that was kind of through the producing and, and that it was, it was only that class that empowered me after school to be like, okay, like I'm starting a company. Here's, you know, I'm talking to equity. I'm negotiating what my agreements are going to be and having a, my rental agreement, like the insurance, you know, like knowing those things. It's really important. I can't tell you how many people are like, so I want to make a movie. Like what's the first thing I got to do? <laughs> and I'm like, copyright the script. And they're like, oh, but I sent it to the Writers Guild. I'm like, no, you have to send it to the U.S. Copyright Office. There's things that you need to do. Have you applied for production insurance yet? No, but do I really need it? Yes. Unless you want to risk one of your trucks hitting someone and like getting sued out of existence. These are the realities, you know, and it's been interesting seeing how many people questioning why things can't just start reshooting. The answer is almost always insurance. No one wants to take the risk of being sued because someone was exposed to COVID while doing a job until, until there's a little more precedent about that. There's like no real indie film production because it's already a huge financial risk to just make a movie, but to suddenly have for these production insurance companies to sort of be like, oh yeah, we'll still cover your shoot, but nothing COVID related, you know? And then you turn to the investors and go like, we're still good, right? And they're like, no. You know, or they'll be like, yeah, sure. But like you assume all the risk, you know, like we can't be named in a lawsuit. And then you turn to your producer and the producer's like, no, you turn around. And if there's no, no one wants to be like the target for someone getting seriously ill or dying because of what you did. But everyone's sort of like, why don't they just do this? Why don't they just like do that? It's like, because no one's, no one wants to take the risk. Yeah. Okay. Final two questions. What separates those that have a career in the arts or entertainment from those that never get started or transition out of it tenacity self-esteem i think there's like two type of people that can make it happen one type of person just doesn't take failure as like a final thing like it's there's like not finality and failure and they can kind of get back up on the horse and then the other person is just delusional and i don't know what's better probably being delusional because you just sleep better at night I know some people who are so unbelievably optimistic and they've maintained this optimism despite everything that would maybe say to the contrary that they should keep doing this. But because they're delusional and they just kind of keep doing it and they, do, and they maybe do get better at it and they meet the right people and they're fun to work, like you kind of can maybe sort of stick with it long enough. So you either have to be really good at lying to yourself or you really have to have the ability to kind of shake it off and sadly, maybe a lot of that is either just purely in someone's DNA or whether their parents were supportive or not. I had definitely had a mom who was like, you can do anything you want. And I went to a school where they're like, you can do anything you want. You're good enough. You're strong enough. Doggone it. People like you, <laughs> you know, and like, and like kind of being told that your whole life. And there's definitely been times where I've like realized like, damn, I'm not good enough or like damn, people don't like me. There's times that the delusion is cracked, but I've also, I've had enough sort of success where like, no, no, I really did get those good reviews. I really did have someone read this and, and wanted to make it. You have to find your signposts that say like, you should keep going. But if your signpost is like, well, if I don't have an Oscar by the time I'm 30, like then just stop now. You know what I mean? I, there's like, you have to be able to, you have to be able to say there's going to be a lot more signs that tell you to stop doing it than to keep doing it. That's where the kind of resilience comes in. Right, right. Final question. Where can people find out more about you? Oh, God, probably just Twitter. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, on, I'm on Twitter way too much. Pretty much Twitter. All right. Well, Kevin, thank you so much for giving us your time and sitting and chatting with us. No problem. I really appreciate it. That was our interview with Kevin T. Morales. My takeaways were student loan debt is a problem in the United States. It puts people into and keeps people in poverty. If we allowed student debt for high school, there would be an uproar. Yet somehow we accept that it is a necessity for higher education. Without a credit card, you can't build credit. But it is possible to live without one. If the choice is to go into debt with good credit, or have no debt but no credit, then perhaps no debt is better. Having an entire family working in the entertainment industry is really cool. It's amazing that Kevin and his wife have done it, and they seem to have an amazing family. If you want to hear more of our chat, please visit patreon.com artisticfinance, where I've posted the rest of the interview. That's it for today. 
Until next time, break a leg. Thank you for listening to Artistic Finance. Find more information on our website, artisticfinance.com. Please subscribe to our podcast and please leave a rating and review. Artistic Finance is produced in New York City by Nicole and Ethan Steinle. Producing consultant Anne Nygren-Doherty. Graphics and website by Josh Cutler. Music by Chong Liu. Music by Chong Liu.